Now today we're going to continue in uh, uh, the book of 1 Samuel, and we're going to continue to look at the life of David. But today we're going to be taking a look at two different passages, um, and this is towards the end of uh, 1 Samuel, right? But if you guys have your Bibles now, if you guys have your journals, I want to ask you guys to open up your Bibles and your journals to um, 1 Samuel chapter 28, verses 3 to 7. And 1 Samuel chapter 30, verses 1 through 6. All right, 1 Samuel chapter 28, verses 3 to 7. And 1 Samuel chapter 30, verses 1 through 6. Let me read 1 Samuel chapter 28, verses 3 to 7 first. And then I'll read uh, 1 Samuel chapter 30, 1 through 6 right after that. So 1 Samuel chapter 28, verses 3 to 7, it says, Now Samuel was dead, and all Israel had mourned for him, and buried him in his own town of Ramah. Saul had expelled the mediums and spiritists from the land. The Philistines assembled and came and set up camp at Shunem, while Saul gathered all Israel and set up camp at Gilboa. When Saul saw the Philistine army, he was afraid. Terror filled his heart. He inquired of the Lord, but the Lord did not answer him by dreams or Urim or prophets. Saul then said to his attendants, Find me a woman who is a medium so I may go and inquire of her. There is one in Endor, they said. Now let me read from chapter 30, verses 1 through 6. It says, David and his men reached Ziklag on the third day. Now the Amalekites had raided the Negev and Ziklag. They had attacked Ziklag and burned it, and had taken captive the woman and everyone else in it, both young and old. They killed none of them, but carried them off as they went on their way. When David and his men reached Ziklag, they found it destroyed by fire and their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. So David and his men wept aloud until they had no strength left to weep. David's two wives had been captured, Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail, the wi widow of Nabal of Carmel. David was greatly distressed because the men were talking of stoning him. Each one was bitter in spirit because of his sons and daughters, but David found strength in the Lord his God. Amen. You know, the reason why we're looking at these two passages today is we're comparing the way that Saul and David dealt with a crisis in their life. You know, Saul was in the middle of one of the biggest crises in his life. He was, he, he had always been fighting the Philistines until now, but now was a time when the Philistines were assembling to make one big final blow to try to kill Saul. So this was a very difficult situation. And not only that, Saul, when he saw the army, he was distressed. He knew this looks like the end. And so he was in the middle of a serious crisis in his life. David, likewise, was in a very tough situation. David actually, in this time, as we're looking at this passage in 1 Samuel 30, he was actually in Philistine territory um, underneath one of the Philistine commanders. I know it's very, it's very strange, right? Why in David's history was he serving the Philistines? But in this time, that's where he was. And he was, he was, in the, um, he was stationed in a city named Ziklag. And he had been away from Ziklag with his men. But when they returned, what they found out was that the Amalekites had come and destroyed the city and taken his wives and children and the wives and children of all the men, right? And so all the men, David's followers, they are angry at him. They are so angry and they're ready to stone and kill him. And so David, he is also in a, such a distressing situation. Both men, David and Saul, were in the middle of a very serious crisis in their life. A moment where they felt like they were at the end of a cliff. But in a moment like that, you see a serious contrast between the way that David responded to the situation and Saul responded to the situation. And what, what you see is that Saul, he goes and looks for a medium. And a medium was basically a fortune teller, a sorcerer. Basically, when Saul is in the middle, in the middle of a difficult situation, he, what he does is he resorts to witchcraft and sorcery. Right? He, he resorts to idolatry. But what does David do? In the middle of his distress, it says David was greatly distressed because the men were talking of stoning him. Each one was bitter in spirit because of his sons and daughters. But David found strength in the Lord his God. 
you know, what really truly defines a person is not who, you know, what, whether they have problems in their lives or not. It's how do they cope with the problems in their lives? How do they cope, cope with the crises that come into their lives? Both men were in one of the worst crises. And it's in such moments that you see true colors. You see that Saul, the reason why he was rejected as king is because in the midst of his terror, in the midst of his crisis, he runs away to other sources, not God, right? But David found his strength in the Lord his God. You're in the middle of a crisis. Where do you run to? What kind of person are you? What's more important is how you respond to the crises in your life, not whether you have a crisis in your life. And today I want to share with you guys about how David had metal, right? David had metal. And metal is not metal as an M-E-T-A-L, not metal, the kind of material that you talk about. Metal is M-E-T-T-L-E. It's talking about a person's ability to cope with difficulties or a demanding situation in a resilient way. A person's ability to cope with difficulties or a demanding situation in a resilient way. And I believe that this is one of the qualities that you need to develop as someone who's going to be useful to God. God is looking for people who have metal, people who are able in the midst of a crisis to look to God, to have the proper safeguards, to be able to cope with that crisis. You know, um, I'm a very happily married man. Um, I always talk about my wife and my son in my sermon as illustrations. And because of that, you know, some of you guys might actually think that, you know, I'm having a very difficult time in my married life or my, you know, my being a parent, you know, I, I have such a bad son or something like that. It's nothing like that. You know, I'm such a happily married man. I, I believe that I've married the most wonderful woman in the world. Um, I'm very happy to be married to Esther, Esther Huang. But, you know, what you see is that, you know, in, in my experience, I, I, I think that, you know, marriage and parenting, you know, truly are instruments that God uses to, uh, to, to train, right? <laughs> to train people. And the reason why I say that is, you know, before, before I got married, before I got married, you know, when, 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 I, when I didn't have a wife, I always was able to uh, show people, right? Show people a face. In other words, whenever um, things got difficult, right? I'd just go home. I'd be away from them. And then when I'm ready to meet them again, I, I can meet them and I'd show them the nice side of me. I'd show them, you know, how caring I was. I'd show them you know, when I'm smelling nice, when I look nice, you know, when I'm doing all these things, then I, I can be with them. But in married life, there's no such thing as going home. Right? You're always together with your partner. And so your partner gets to see every side of you, the good, the bad, the ugly, right? The smelly, right? They see every part of you. And not only that, they see how you truly act in the middle of a crisis. They get to see when, when, when Sam is walking through a difficult time, when he is angry, when he's in the middle of a crisis, what does he do? And, and I want to tell you guys, in the midst of a crisis, that's when you see true colors. That's when you see, is this person someone who's truly going to walk with God and it is going to be used by God? Or is he somebody that's like Saul who's going to be rejected? And there's a reason why Saul was rejected. There's a reason why David was useful in God's hands. There was a reason why God chose David. It's because in his life, he guarded several things that allowed him to have the metal to cope with these crises. It wasn't just, you know, it wasn't just a matter of just, you know, preference, just I prefer David over Saul. No, David in his life had several things that he guarded. And the reason why he guarded this is because he knew that they were the things that would safeguard him. They, they were the things that were going to help him cope with these difficult situations. And I want to share what these you know, three things are today. 
You know, what you see with David is, first of all, he guarded his spiritual life. In the midst of this crisis, what you see with David is he had a vibrant relationship with God. And that was his first line of defense. That was his first line of defense. You know, a crisis is bound to come in our lives. Let me, let me warn you guys, a crisis is bound to come in your life. Now or later, you know, sometime in your life, you, I'm sorry about that. Sometime in your life, you are going to go through a crisis. It's just like the COVID-19 situation. Everyone was saying, right, there, you know, there were some people, um, especially like Bill Gates, like that were warning, you know, everybody and saying that one day there's going to be a pandemic. One day there's going to be a disease that we are going to deal with that's going to really uh, cause a serious disruption in society. And it came true, right? COVID-19 hit us. And right now the whole world is reeling from this, uh, from the disruption that it's causing. And let me tell you too, just like the COVID-19 situation, just like a pandemic, in your life, you're going to experience a a serious crisis. If you haven't already experienced several until now, you will. A crisis is bound to come. It wasn't only Saul who was in the midst of a crisis. It wasn't only Saul who was facing terror and life in, as if he's at the end of the cliff. David also was in a tough spot. You know, we've already been talking about how David's been running away from Saul these past few chapters, right? He's just been running away, running away, running away, even though he knew I'm supposed to be God's chosen one. Now we're in an even worse spot. David runs away to Philistine territory, and he basically works for the Philistine army. But at the same time, he wants to stay loyal to Israel. So he has to trick the Philistines. And every time he goes to battle, he pretends like he had fought the Israelites, but actually he was fighting Israelites. The Israelite enemies, right? And so what you see with David is he's in a very tough spot. And in the midst of that, the Amalekites destroy David's city. They capture all of David's, you know, sons and daughters and wives. And not only David's, but all of his men's sons and daughters and wives. And so, you know, it's, it's a situation where it looks like there's going to be a coup d'etat. They're going to kill David. They say, you know, it's all David's fault. And then David's men, the only people that are, you know, able to really be loyal to him right now, they are about to kill him. David's at the end of a cliff. It looks like there's no way back. It looks like he's just going to die. Right? So David was in a tough spot. And in verse, uh, in 1 Samuel 30, verse 6, it says, David was greatly distressed. Right? David was in a moment that he was uh, greatly distressed. It wasn't only Saul that experienced this crisis. David also experienced a serious crisis. And I want to remind you guys that we also might, not, not might, we also will experience crises in our lives. You know, the word for distressed in, in verse 6, when it says David was greatly distressed, the word in Hebrew actually means tied up or locked up or cramped or stuck. It basically means you feel like you're stuck somewhere and you have no way of getting out. We've all been in situations like that, right? Where we feel like there's no way out of this. I'm stuck. I can't get out. I'm powerless to get out. Are you in a place of crisis right now? You know, um, the thing about crises is nobody else, you know, may be aware of the crisis that you're walking through. No one else in your life might actually know that you're walking through this crisis. You know, one of the th scary things about depression, right? Depression is that depression hits uh, so many people. And, um, you know, depression isn't just an issue that comes to people that you look at and you're like, that person's probably depressed. No, depression comes and hits those people that you think that person can't possibly be depressed, right? They always look so happy. They're always so social. They're always, you know, such an extrovert. They're always with so many people. How can they be depressed? But those are the kinds of people that depression hits. 
And the scary thing about depression is you might seem fine on the inside, but in the inside, uh, on the outside, but in the inside, you're actually suffering. You're actually walking through such a difficult time. And you feel like you're tied up. You feel like you're locked up. You're cramped. You're stuck. You can't get out of this. You're just going to suffer through this your whole life. That's what it feels like to be in the middle of a crisis. And some of you guys, I know you guys might be walking through a crisis right now. You guys might be walking through such a difficult time like right now. But I want to remind you guys that walking through a crisis isn't the problem. Everyone is bound to walk through a crisis. David was stuck in a situation that was hopeless, and it says that he was greatly distressed. But let me remind you guys, what's important is not whether we have a crisis in our lives. It's how do we cope with the crisis when it happens. And David had several things in his life, three things in his life that he guarded in order to be able to overcome the crisis in his life. And as I shared with you guys, the first thing, his first line of defense was a vibrant, healthy spiritual life. He guarded his spiritual life. That's what sustained him. In the end of verse 6, after it says David was greatly distressed, right? It says, but David found strength in the Lord his God. David found strength in the Lord his God. And actually, as I was comparing chapter 28 and chapter 30, I was wondering to myself, what's the difference between Saul and David? You know, if you look in chapter 28, Saul even goes to God. In the midst of his crisis, he looks to God, but God does not answer. And I was like, is this unfair? David goes to God and God strengthens him, right? Saul goes to God and God rejects him. Isn't this unfair? And when you look in chapter 28, verse 5, it says, When Saul saw the Philistine army, he was afraid. Terror filled his heart. And so he inquired of the Lord, but the Lord did not answer him by dreams or Urim or prophets. What's the difference between David and Saul? Why did God answer David but not Saul? You know, actually, when you read this passage, chapter 28, verse 5, you should feel... A, a sense of irony and the reason why I say you, you should feel a sense of irony is because in the midst of Saul's terror he, 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 he tries to inquire of God he tries to go to the prophets and he you know he asks them to um, inquire of God for him it seems like Saul is going to God right for help and he is right he's going to God for help but the reason why you should feel irony is several chapters back you remember when Saul does not like what God has to say, you know what Saul does? Saul is willing to kill the priests. In fact, Saul killed, Saul ordered for the murdering of all of the priests at Nob. Why? Because they, you know, they assisted David and his men by giving some bread, by giving, you know, Goliath's sword. And so he's like, you guys are done. I'm going to kill you. And what you see in Saul's attitude is, yes, in, an, in, in the middle of a difficult situation, he's like, God, help me. But usually in his life, his regard, his fear for God is not there, right? When God is useless to him, he's willing to abandon God. But when God is needed, that's when he comes running to God. You know, Saul, his, his attitude towards God was not... It wasn't healthy. He didn't have a healthy spiritual life. His, his life was the kind where he only looked for God when he was in the middle of a serious crisis. You know, but what you see with David in chapter 30, verse 6, verse six it says, David found strength in the Lord his God. In the Lord his God. In other words, what you see with David is, he had a regular relationship with God. It was in a moment of difficulty that he came to God and God already had a relationship. And so because God was his God, because it was his God, right? He already had that personal relationship. God responded. 
You know, the reason why God did not respond to Saul when he inquired of God is because of his attitude towards God. And we got to really look at ourselves. Are we looking at God as kind of like a genie? Or are we looking at God as uh, someone who we worship, someone who we walk with, who we have a healthy relationship with? Do we only run to God when we need Him? That's looking at God like a genie. You know, um, last year, the movie um, Aladdin, right? The Disney, Disney Live movie, Aladdin came out. And, um, you know, as we were watching Aladdin, uh, me and my wife, you know, I realized that, you know, as, as, a, as a child, as a kid, when I watched Aladdin, when it you know, came out as a cassette tape, right? A VHS cassette tape, right? I used to watch Aladdin so often and a lot of the a lot of the things kind of flew over my head, right? I enjoyed it as a kid, but a lot of the kind of um, layers of the movie, a lot of the kind of, you know, political, you know, side of it kind of flew over my head. I didn't notice any of that kind of stuff. And it was really interesting to watch the movie again as uh, as uh, adult, right? But, you know, as I was watching the movie, I was looking at the lyrics of the song, right, that the genie sings to Aladdin. And, you know, it, I think that this song really reflects kind of how we want God to be, right? We want God to be kind of like this genie. He says, you've never had a friend like me, right? This is some of the lyrics that he sings to Aladdin. Life is your restaurant and I'm your maitre d'. Come whisper to me whatever it is you want. You ain't never had a friend like me. We pride ourselves on service. You the boss, the king, the shah. Say what you wish, it's yours, true dish. How about a little more baklava? Have some of column A, try all of column B. I'm in the mood to help you, dude. You ain't never had a friend like me. And basically what the genie was saying is, hey, you got the trump card. You have right the ace of spades. You have the joker card. Why? Because you have me. And I'll give you three wishes, whatever you ask for. You are the boss, right? There are times when we treat God like a genie. We want him to appear in our lives when things get difficult. But regularly, we don't want a relationship with him. And that's not true spirit. Uh, that's not a truly healthy spiritual life. But that was the kind of life that Saul had. In his desperation, he sought God. But when he didn't need God, he would turn his back on God. That's why he was able to kill the priests of Nob. You know, even non-believers in, in the midst of a serious crisis, you know, they, even non-believers, you know, I, I believe would have, you know, in some situations would pray to God in the midst of a difficult situation, right? But that's not a truly healthy spiritual life. And what differentiates David from Saul is he guarded his spiritual life. He had a regular spiritual life. And that's what was able to be the anchor in the midst of this crisis. It was because he had a healthy relationship with God, a vibrant relationship with God that was unaffected by the crisis. That's why he was able to pull through. That's how he was able to have metal. That's how he was able to walk through this crisis. YEM. We're all walking through a crisis right now. But on a personal level, you might be walking through a crisis. Your first line of defense is your relationship with God. Do you have a healthy relationship with God? Is that what's pulling you through right now? We need to guard our spiritual lives. Now, the second thing that David guarded is he guarded his principles. He guarded his principles. The second line, line of defense is is our principles. It's discipline and order. You know, in chapter 30, verse 7, when David was in the midst of his distress, it says that he found strength in the Lord. And in verse 7, it says, Then David said to Abiathar, the priest, the son of Ahimelech, Bring me the ephod. Abiathar brought it to him, and David inquired of the Lord, Shall I pursue this raiding party? Will I overtake them? Pursue them, he answered. You will certainly overtake them and succeed in the rescue. You know, in the midst of anguish and bitterness, it says that the men were in 
anguish, right? And they were bitter. They were weeping. They were bitter. They were angry. And in the midst of that, they were, they were so exhausted. And yet, what you see with David, in the midst of his exhaustion, in the midst of his weeping and his anguish, David still followed a certain established order. He didn't just throw, right, principles and order out the window. He still followed the established order. You know, I, I, I imagine if, if I was in David's situation and I was in deep anguish, I was just enraged that the Amalekites had taken my wife and my children, right? My, my, my family. You know, it's, it's easy to imagine that we would just throw principle out the window and be like, I'm going to go chase them. I'm going to destroy the Amalekites. God is on my side. Let's go. But with David, what he does is he still follows the established order. He goes and gets the effort. He asks God first, God, should I go and pursue the Amalekites? And when, he, when, when God gives him the green light, that's when he goes. And when we're in anguish, when we're in bitterness, it's easy to self-rationalize. We start to throw principle out the window. We start to throw away the established order. And we say, because I'm in such a tough spot, because I'm in such deep anguish, I deserve to be treated like this. And we start to self-rationalize. And we start to get rid of, and we start to, um, we start to break our own principles, right? But you know, guarding your principles is how you can overcome your crisis crises in your life. As you are walking through a difficult time in your life, don't throw out your principles. Still walk by them, right? Walk by them. That's how you guard your life. You know, in 1 Samuel 28 with Saul, what you see is that he throws out his own principles. When he's in a tough spot, he's willing to abandon his principles. And I'm sure he does it in a self-rationalizing way. In verse 6, says that he inquired of the Lord, but the Lord did not answer him by dreams or Urim or prophets. And so in verse 7, it says, Saul then said to his attendants, Find me a woman who's a medium, so I may go and inquire of her. There's one in Endor, they said. If you guys remember, in the beginning of this passage, it said that Saul himself had expelled the mediums and spirits from the land. And yet here he is. He's the one who expelled them from the land. But now that he's in a difficult situation, he's like, oh, go find those uh, mediums and sorcerers that I expelled. Go find one. Right? And in verse 8, so Saul disguised himself. Because he's the king, he can't be seen going to a medium, right, who he expelled. And yet he tells his men to go find a medium. And then he disguises himself, putting on other clothes. And at night, he and two men went to the woman. And he says, consult a spirit for me and bring up for me the one I name. But the woman, right? The woman said to him, surely you know what Saul has done. She doesn't know it's Saul. And so she's like, surely you know what Saul has done. He's cut off the mediums and spiritists from the land. Why have you set a trap for my life to bring about my death? And then in verse 10, Saul swore to her by the Lord. As surely as the Lord lives, you will not be punished for this. You know, this is ugly, right? Saul is going against his own principles. He is the one who expelled the spiritists and the mediums from the land. But now that he's desperate, he is willing to abandon his principles and to seek a spiritist. You know, self-rationalizing behavior a lot of times is like this. When you're in a desperate situation, you start to self-rationalize and you say, Oh, you know, in normal times, principles, they, you know, I follow them. But now is a desperate time. Now is a time where I deserve a couple of liberties, right? You know, what I realize is that when I'm tired, when I'm exhausted, that's when my uh, ability to guard my principles is the weakest. You know, that late night drive through to McDonald's, is always the most tempting, right? That, that time when you're so exhausted, you're, you just finished a busy day and you're so um, drained, that's the kind of time when you feel like, I deserve a Big Mac set with extra large fries and 
and a extra large Coke, right? Usually I'll drink diet, but today I deserve a Coke. I mean, I worked hard, right? And a lot of times it's in the middle of difficulty, exhaustion, right? Sorrow that we feel this freedom to kind of throw out the principles and be like, I deserve this. But you know, a lot of times when I, you know, <laughs> I'm sorry guys, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm not saying that I'm someone who is able to keep my principles all the time. And there have been times when I've made these um, um, McDonald's drive throughs right? When I go and eat McDonald's on an exhausted day, it doesn't end with McDonald's. I usually go home and I eat some more snacks. And what you see is, it's like a snowball effect. When you throw principle out the window, man, that's that's an open door for you to commit sin and do so many things that just brings havoc and chaos into your life. It's exactly like the, the pattern you see with eating, right? And, and although eating is just an illustration, it illustrates the principle behind this. When you don't guard your principles in the middle of a crisis, it opens the door, right? It opens the door for so much other sin and chaos to enter in. And the reason why David, right, David was able to overcome, right, this crisis was because even in the midst of such anguish and difficulty, even in the midst of his distress, he did not abandon his principles. He lived by them. You know, for those of you guys who are going through a difficult time in your life, don't abandon your principles. Don't abandon order and discipline. That is God's design. That's how you are going to protect yourself in the midst of your crisis. Don't abandon your principles. The last thing you see with David is he guarded his generous generosity. He guarded his generosity. You know, um, in, in chapter 30, when David and his men, you know, they, they, the Amalekites had come and destroyed Ziklag and taken their wives and um, children. And when, when David and his men, they, they seek God, they inquire of God, and God responds, go and, go and attack the Amalekites, go pursue them, right? Um, in verse 9 and 10, it says, David and the 600 men with him came to the Besor Valley, where some stayed behind. You know, the, David's men, they were so exhausted, right? And they all went to chase the Amalekites, but... Um, some of them stayed behind, it says in verse 10, 200 of them were too exhausted to cross the valley. But David and the other 400 continued the pursuit. And so what you see in the situation is that 600 men were going, but 200 were too exhausted, so they stayed behind. And the 400 continued to pursue the Amalekites. And in verse 17, it says, David fought them from dusk until the evening of the next day. And none of them got away except 400 young men who rode off on camels and fled. David recovered everything the Amalekites had taken, including his two wives. Nothing was missing, young or old, boy or girl, plunder, or anything else they had taken. David brought back everything. He took all the flocks and herds, and his men drove them ahead of the other livestock, saying, This is David's plunder. Then David came to the 200 men who had been too exhausted to follow him, and were left behind at the Besser Valley. They came out to meet David and the men with him. As David and his men approached, he asked them how they were. Now, this is the important part. What you see is, you know, the 400 men, they continued the chase. They, they defeated the Amalekites. They took back everything and they, you know, brought all the plunder. They brought their wives and children, everything, right? And, you know, if you imagine that situation and you're one of the 400, I'm sure that there's this thought, the 200 who stayed behind, they don't deserve the plunder. I mean, we worked our butt, right? We were exhausted too. We were distressed too. We were in such difficulty too. And yet we went and defeated the Amalekites. Now, are we going to share the plunder with the 200 who didn't go, who were lazy, right? who were exhausted? But in the midst of that, what you see with David is he, you know, the reason why David was a great leader was in such a time where he could have just gone with the flow, he shows his true leadership 
in the policies that he makes. In verse 22, But all the evil men and troublemakers among David's followers said, Because they did not go out with us, we will not share with them the plunder we recovered. However, each man may take his wife and children and go. But this is what David does. David replied, No, my brothers, you must not do that with what the Lord has given us. He has protected us and delivered into our hands the raiding party that came against us. Who will listen to what you say? The share of the man who stayed with the supplies is to be the same as that of him who went down to the battle. All will share alike. And what's more important is David made this a statute, statute and ordinance for Israel from that day to this. When David reached Ziklag, he sent some of the plunder to the elders of Judah, who were his friends, saying, Here's a gift for you from the plunder of the Lord's enemies. David sent it to those who were in Bethel, Ramath Negev, and Jatir, to those in Aroer, Sitmua, Eshtemoa, and Rakal, to those in the towns of the Jeremielites and the Kenites, and to those in Horma, Bor Ashan, Athak, and Hebron, and to those in all the other places where he and his men had roamed. Man, what you see with David is, he is generous. Even when he should be worried about his own skin, what you see with David is he's generous. You know, right now, um, one of the things that I'm kind of worried about is, you know, there's this word that we've been using to, um, to talk about the health precautions, right? We, we're always talking about social distancing, and that's that's the term that's been used, right? Sawejak um, koridugi, right? It's social distancing, and this this word, you know, really they shouldn't have coined coined it as social distancing. I don't know who coined this word, right? But they shouldn't have called it social distancing because what you see is right now. As people are being forced to stay home, as people are working remotely, right? A lot of companies, uh, they're working remotely. Um, and even after the COVID-19 situation um, kind of subsides, they're saying that a lot of companies probably will continue uh, to work remotely, to work in shifts, right? But all of this uh, distancing, all of this kind of uh, health precaution, what you have to realize is that we need to be very careful that this social distancing does not make our hearts distant from each other, right? And it's very much easy to do so. Right now with online platforms, like things like that, yes, there is some social you know, interaction. There is some, some kind of an interaction going on. But at the same time, it's not the same as before. And so very easily, we can become a lot more separated we can be a lot more kind of uh, distant from each other but you know god created us for community right god created us for community and let me remind you guys that you know when we're, when you're going through a tough time it seems like the most wise thing you can do is just care for your own skin right when we're usually going through uh, times of crisis, when we're walking through difficult times, a lot of times it seems justified, right? For us to try to just think about ourselves and our own skin, right? I don't have the luxury to think about other people right now. I have to worry about myself. But you know what's going to help you through that crisis? Is when you guard your generosity. When you guard the heart that you have for other people. And so I want to remind you guys, yes, keep the distance as a health precaution, but don't socially distance yourself from people. What I mean by that is don't let your hearts be distant from other people. Continue to practice generosity. Continue to care for the people around you. Not only for your own sake, but for their sake as well. God created us for community and it's that generous heart, that generosity, that's going to give you metal in times of difficulty. You know, Saul, when he was walking through difficulty, all he cared about was his own life and his own safety. That's why when he felt threatened by David, instead of going to attack the Philistines, right? The Philistines were the enemies of Israel. That's who the king should be fighting. But Saul, because he was so worried about his own kingship, what does he do? He chases David the Israelite hero. What's he doing? Right? 
He's wasting resources and time and energy on David, an internal struggle, right? David never had malintent either, right? And yet he was wasting his energy here when he should have been fighting the Philistines. And whenever we become selfish in our hearts, whenever we become so absorbed by our own life, man, that's just going to eat you up. You need to guard your generosity. You need to guard your hearts that are able to have compassion and love other people. That's what's going to give you metal to walk through times of difficulty. YM, let's be people that guard our spiritual lives, right? Whether it's you know life as usual or whether it's life in, in the midst of a crisis, we need to guard our spiritual lives. And we need to guard our principles. Don't let it go out the window. No matter what you're walking through, always guard your principles. What you feel like God has placed on your life, you walk by those principles. And lastly, guard your generosity. Guard that heart of generosity that you have towards other people. Especially in times like this, I want to ask you guys, I want to really strongly encourage you guys to stay connected with your families, with your cell groups, with the church, with the people in your workplace, with the people around you. Stay connected, right? Continue to guard your generosity. Amen?